Hi everyone. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off last time. Um, so I'm last time I was standing in front of the board. I don't know how helpful that was because <laughs> I didn't really end up writing anything down. Um, these notes, for the most part, are fairly complete. So there could be times where I need to go over to the board, but for right now, I'm just gonna uh, continue to work through these these notes and just discuss them. Um, as I as I kind of look through them, I'm sitting here at my desk now, uh, getting ready to do that here with you. Now, remember, last time we were um, we were looking at this simplified version of uh, this board right here. Okay, I'm kind of circling this with my mouse right now, um, and the question was, okay, I want to count the number of ways to place, uh, you know, two or three um, dwarves on these, <laughs> on these squares, um, because that's going to be the number of ways to assign uh, some number of dwarves uh, lousy jobs simultaneously. And breaking it down into these little subsquares seemed to be the most uh, simple way to do that because thinking about it like this disaster over here on the left it's like how in the world are you gonna are you gonna count stuff so at least over here uh, over here I have a situation that seems to be a little bit more tractable uh, to pull that off so we're asking ourselves okay first of all how many ways are there to place uh, one dwarf on these squares and instead of talking about dwarves we decided Talking about rooks made sense because uh, placing a rook on this upper left square, for instance, prevents another rook from being placed in that same column and row. Um, and that's why we talk about rooks being placed in a non-capturing way. And then I would place a second rook, you know, on one of the squares that was still available after eliminating this first row or this first column in this first row, et cetera. Um, but in general, uh, the question is, how, how many ways are there to place some number of rooks on these dark squares? Okay, so that's the problem we're gonna tackle now with this, this nice little diagram being a, a central feature of, of how we're gonna pull off that counting problem. Okay, so let's scroll down here a little bit. Uh, incidentally, I I sent out a message about this. Hopefully, you got it. But um, basically, all I said was that uh, the combinatorics notes, the ones I use as I'm talking to you in class, for the most part, those are on Canvas under the Files tab. And I think I might have said that it's called Comb Notes, but uh, I renamed it to Combinatorics Notes. Uh, because because that's a better name. All right, so let's look at this. Okay, so first of all, in this picture up here, there's basically two subboards. There's this upper left subboard right here, and there's this kind of lower right one. And this junk over here, I mean, there's no restrictions at all over there, right? Uh, and the key is, I call the entire collection of dark squares, I call that a board. But I'm going to call this board over here on the upper left, I'll call that a subboard, board number one, and I'll call this subboard number two. The reason I kind of think of the board as being decomposed into these two subboards is because, like, if I place a rook on these dark squares over here, it doesn't impact placement of a rook down here. And that is a critical uh, simplification, critical observation. It's going to help us uh, count things more effectively down below, okay? So the board, when I say board, I'm talking about all the dark squares. Subboard, I'm talking about these little uh, decomposed parts that don't interact with other decomposed parts. So we'd have the board and we have the subboards that are the, um, that are, you know, 
uh, little the little substructures inside the board itself that don't interact with other substructures. Okay, let's get to it. So here we go. So let's call the two subboards above B1 and B2. Okay, uh, the entire board is B. Uh, those two boards, B1 and B2, are disjoint from one another. Okay, they have no interaction whatsoever. And then we're going to invent some notation here. So R sub K of B is going to be the number of ways to place K non-capturing rooks on the entire board. Um, that is in the darkened squares, right? So the board, the entire board, I'm just thinking about the darkened squares. And remember, that's exactly the number of ways to place uh, K dwarves simultaneously into K lousy jobs, right? So those are the kind of the bad placement of dwarves into jobs, K of them, okay? So let's call R sub K of B1, let's let that be the number of ways to place K non-capturing rooks on board one and similarly for board two, all right? So, so here's kind of like a basic observation here. How many ways are there to place zero rooks? That's what this thing is right here, R sub zero of B1. How many ways are there to place zero rooks on board one? Well, <laughs> uh, one, you just don't put anything, right? I mean, you just sit there. Um, on the other hand, what about R sub one of B1? Well, that means the number of ways to place one non-attacking rook on board one. And remember, board one, scrolling up, is this thing right here. So how many ways are there to place one rook in a non-capturing way? Well, for crying out loud, I don't, I don't have to worry about additional rooks. So all I have to do is place it on one of these six squares. And similarly for, you know, for R1 of B2, um, there are three down here. But... That's why this R sub one of B1 is equal to six, okay? R sub one of B1 is equal to six. Now, R sub two of B1 equal to 10. How in the world did, did we get that? Oh, by the way, let me, just, let me just remark, R sub zero of B2 is obviously one. R sub one of B2 is obviously three because there were three squares. Um, but let's let's talk about R sub two of B one. Well, R sub two of B two is easy. You go up here, and you say, okay, this is B two. How many ways are there to place, you know, two rooks on this board simultaneously so that they do not capture one another? Well, um, look, you know. I obviously can't even place two rooks on these two squares because they would be attacking each other. So if I'm going to place two rooks, one of them has to be in this upper right dark square. And if I place a rook there, then I have two choices in which to place the other rook. So that is why I get R2 of B2 equal to two. And incidentally, that's also why R sub three of B2 is zero. I mean. Seriously, there's not even three columns. There's not even three columns. I would need at least three columns to place three rooks in a non-capturing way. That is why R sub three of B2 is equal to zero, and so is R sub four of B2. What about this R sub two of B1? Well, let's take a peek at that. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a, little, bit, a little bit more complicated. So, um, essentially, I can place a rook. Let, let's let's talk about. Let's just kind of work our way from left to right and top to bottom. Okay. So, ours. Okay. So if I I'm going to place two rooks on this board right here. If I place a rook in the upper left corner, that eliminates this uh, this square below it and this square to the right of it. So how many options do I have for where I could place the second rook? So if a rook is here in this upper left square, then that eliminates this 
row, this row and this column, and I would have one, two, three places I could place a second rook. So that's three. If I place a rook in the upper left square, I have three ways to place a second rook. Okay. Um, let's, let's finish off this first column first. So what if I place a rook right here in this square in the first column? Well, that eliminates this row and this column. And I would have one, two, three places in which I could place a second rook, okay? So again, three options if I place the rook here in the upper left, three options if I place the, the rook right here in the second darkened square in column one. Three plus three equals six, yes? Um, so we have six so far. And, and, and we have dealt with all the cases where I placed a rook in the first column, okay? Next, uh, what if I placed a rook in the first row in the second column? All right. Well, and incidentally, I'm not going to think about putting the second rook in the first column anywhere because I already dealt with that. That case is done. Any case where a rook is in the first column in board one is done. So now I'm going to think about placing a first rook here in row one, column two. And these, these two squares are out because I've already dealt with those cases. Well, if I place a rook here, excuse me, that eliminates this column completely, the second column. And I have one, two places in which I could place a second rook. Okay, so that's two more options. I place a rook here and there's one, two options. Added to the six from before, which give me eight. And finally, if I place the a first rook right here in row, well, I guess it's, it's labeled row five, but it's really the second row, column two, then, um, uh, then it eliminates this, this entry up here, and I have two options for where I could place the second rook. Okay, so that's two plus two, is four added to the six from before, and that is 10, my friends, okay? Uh, that is why R2 of B1 equals 10, okay? So what about R3 of B1? So that means how many ways are there to place three rooks on board one uh, so that the rooks aren't attacking one another? All right, well, let's think about it. Um, so, yeah, three rooks. So first of all, one thing you should notice is that means I'm gonna have to place a rook in each one of these columns in board one, because there's only three columns in the first place. Okay, if I want to place three rooks in a non-capturing way, I need at least three columns, and I have exactly three columns. Therefore, there will be exactly one rook in each one of these columns. All right? so. Let's kind of uh, proceed like we did before. What if I placed, uh, you know, what if I placed a rook right here in the upper left entry? Well, that would eliminate row one in column one. I would have to place a rook in this dark square right here, which is, you know, the second row and second column, but it's labeled as row five from the first picture over there. Okay, so I would have a rook here and here, okay? And then I would basically have complete freedom with where to put the, the third rook. So I have two options, okay? So it would be the rook would go here, second rook here, and the third rook would go either here or here. So that's one, two options, okay? The only other option, my friends, is to put the first rook, because I have to put a rook in the first column is to put the first rook here in the third row in the first column. Okay, so I put that here, that eliminates this row, the third row in the first column. Therefore, I would have to place a rook in this lower right uh, darkened square because I have to have a rook in this third column. Okay, so the, there would be a rook here, there would be a rook here. 
but then I would have complete freedom with where to place the third rook here in the second column. Okay, so I'd have two options. So I had two from the first case here, and then two from this one, which is a total of four, which is why R3 of B1 is four. And of course, R4 of B1, which means, hey, can you place four rooks on board one? Um, how many ways can you do it? Well, that's clearly zero because I don't even have four columns to work with. I do have four rows, but I don't have I don't have four columns to work with. Okay, so I can't I can't do it. Okay, so that's why this R four of B two or R four of B one is equal to zero. Okay. Yeah, so let's think about this. So I've done all of the rook work <laughs> on the subboards B1 and B2. What about on the board itself, the big board? Well, uh, clearly the number of ways to place zero rooks on the board is just one. You don't do anything. Uh, what about one rook on the board? Well, it's pretty clear it's pretty clear that, uh, that that means I just need to place either one rook on board one or, that's why there's a plus, one rook on board two. So the number of ways to place one rook on the entire board is equal to uh, R1 of B1 plus R1 of B2. Huh, what is going on here? Um, let's think about this, okay? Okay, so what about R2 of B? Well, uh, then we start to have an idea. We say to ourselves, well, man, if I want to place two rooks on, on B, then that means I basically need to put zero rooks on board one and two rooks on board two or one rook on board one and one rook on board two, or two rooks on board one and zero rooks on board two. That's the only, uh, that's the only uh, way that you could pull this off. So that's why up here, so like what, what we're saying is, if you wanna put two rooks on this entire board, then either you need to put zero here and two here, or one on each of these, or two here and zero here in a non-capturing way. So that's where you get this formula. Yeah. And actually, uh, even R1 of B was kind of obeying this. R1 of B, you could have thought of this as R0 of B1 times R, you know, or R0, okay. Uh, R1 of B1 times R0 of B2 plus R0 of B1 times R1 of B2. You either place one rook on board one and none on board two, or the opposite of that. And actually, even this R0 of B, you could think of that as R0 of B1 times R0 of B2. And that, and you would get that one. And then, and then suddenly you're like, oh man, now I, uh, I see how to kind of pull this off in general. R3 of B, look at it. R3 of B, that would mean I need to put zero on B1, uh, three on B2, All right? So you multiply those together, or, which is plus, one on B1 and, and two on B2, okay? So you multiply the ways that you can do that in each one of those subboards, because again, they, they are, they're independent of one another. Or you put two on B1 and one on B2, or three on B1 and zero on B2. Yeah, and I say, these last equations should be familiar from section 6.2. They should remind you of the sort of thing we were doing when we were doing generating functions, generating functions. So these formulas, man, uh, that really should make you inclined to create a polynomial of some kind. And that is exactly what we're going to do. We create this thing right here. Okay, this is a big deal. We create this thing right here. We call this the Rook polynomial for a board. Capital R of X comma B. 
Okay, so x is the variable. It's kind of like the generating function variable. And b, uh, b is the board in question. Okay, and then you just sum n going from zero to infinity, r sub n of b, x to the n. It's like a, it's a generating function for the rook numbers. Okay, these rook numbers. And uh, so we call this the rook polynomial uh, for this board. And what's miraculous is, okay, like R0 of B is R0 of B1 times R0 of B2, okay? R1 of B is R1 of B1 times R0 of B2 plus R1 of B2 times R0 of B1. That's exactly what you get if I were to multiply together the rook polynomials of B1 and B2, okay? That's exactly what would happen. Those, you know, when you would multiply that out algebraically, uh, this is exactly what you would end up doing to get the coefficient of, of x to the n, okay? So that's why we can actually write down this formula. The rook polynomial for B is just the product of the rook polynomials for the, the two disjoint subboards that we came up with. So that's why, uh, you know, that's why we, we were inclined to break things up the way that we were. Um, it's simpler to deal with, and it's just easier to count the things we want. And look at this now. All you have to do is you have to compute the rook polynomial for board one, and you get this. Okay, so this is, R, you know, R0B1 of B1 is one, and then R1 of B1 is six, R2 of B1, okay, if I, right, if I kind of scroll up here a little bit, R2 of B1 is 10, so that's what goes next to X squared, R3 of B1 is four, that's what goes next to X cubed, and similarly, you write down the rook polynomial for B2, and when you multiply these things together, you get the rook polynomial, it's right there. And then, remember up here, let me, let me kind of scroll up here, SK was the number of ways to replace those uh, rooks, okay? And that's, that's just our RK of B times seven minus K factorial. So we can use the rook polynomial to, to give us those numbers. SK is just gonna be the coefficient, okay? Look at this, this is amazing. Put it, uh, it's the coefficient of x to the k of the rook polynomial x with board b, okay? That is going to be the rook number, r sub k of b, times seven minus k factorial, right? So that's where this little formula comes from. And remember, uh, you know, going back up here, we had a formula for the number of ways to place dwarves. It was n minus s1 plus s2 minus s3, et cetera. Um, and we started computing that. We had nine times six factorial. Um, we went down here, we ended up with 30 times five factorial for s2. That was a little uh, ugly. But now look at how simple this is. Uh, so there's the nine times six factorial. Where'd this nine, six factorial, where'd this nine come from? Well, it comes from right here. It's sitting right there, right there on the rook polynomial. It's the coefficient of x to the one. It's right there. That's why there's a nine right here. And then you have a six factorial to assign the other uh, dwarves. Plus, this is, this is the S2 term. 30, where does that come from? Well, right here. It's the coefficient of x squared of the rook polynomial. Okay, for the board. Minus S3, okay, 46, where does that come from? Well, it's right here, for crying out loud. Okay, um, there's, uh, there's uh, the number of ways to place three rooks is sitting right there, 46, and four factorial, plus 32, that, this 32 comes from right here, the, the coefficient of x to the fourth, et cetera. And you get the answer right here, okay? Uh, so I just want to end this like this part of the lecture by looking at this these couple of theorems which we basically justified up here. Theorem, this theorem says if B is a board of darkened squares that decomposes into two disjoint subboards B1 and B2, then the rook polynomial of X and B is equal to the product of the 
uh, respective rook polynomials for B1 and B2. And by the way, you might have even more uh, board decompositions. There might be like five that are disjoint and you would just have the product of those five, okay? Um, this is amazing stuff, okay? The number of ways to arrange indistinct objects when there are restricted positions, which is basically like the generalized dwarf problem and job problem in dwarves and in jobs is just this, in factorial, the total number of assignments minus uh, R1 of B times N minus one factorial plus R2 of B times N minus two factorial, et cetera, where B is just the board of darkened restricted positions. That's it. And so this is the formula that you end up with from the principle of inclusion exclusion. Okay. And uh, man, that's it. There's the formula right there. Rook polynomials help you count these rook numbers. Um, and that's it. Well, next time we'll talk about um, some of these, some ways to decompose boards that appear to be decomp de in decomposable at first. But the main thrust of, of really all of section 8.3 is, is getting to this point right here and realizing that the rook polynomials are the things that help us count those, those rook numbers um, where we're placing non-capturing rooks on the board. Okay?